In this session, I'd like to talk about whistleblowers. I'd like to start the session by introducing a quote from the now deceased Italian writer Umberto Eco, who claimed that the state has its eye on every citizen, but every citizen, at least every hacker, the citizen's self-appointed avenger, can pry into the state's every secret. This notion that Echo talked about in 2010 came at a very timely point in history, given the emergence of the company and the people I'd like to talk about today, namely the prominent role played by hackers aligned with groups like WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. What I'm going to do in this video is talk about the role that the press plays in relationship to whistleblowers and uh, secretive sources. I'll chart a kind of very brief history of some of the most prominent whistleblowers in the contemporary period uh, before ending on a discussion based around the contribution made over the last decade to journalistic whistleblowing by the likes of Julian Assange of WikiLeaks. Lots of people give journalists information. Sometimes these people are well-placed, they're knowledgeable, they provide information over an extended period of time. These people are, of course, sources, and they are vital to journalism. Frequently, these sources, because of the kind of information that they hold, may wish to remain anonymous. We're all probably familiar with the immutable rule of good journalism, that journalists should be willing to go to jail rather than to burn or reveal their source. The success of their career trajectory, of the journalist's career trajectory, can often be bound on their integrity. Now, not every journalist will face such an ethical quandary, but the journalist that is involved in investigation or investigative work, or is closely bound up in political journalism, will perhaps come across something similar. Perhaps the most iconic of examples involve Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein and their investigation of Deep Throat in the US. For those of you unfamiliar with the work of Woodward and Bernstein, they were two journalists working for the Washington Post at the start of uh, the 1970s, around about 1972, uh, and they were asked to investigate the burglary that took place at the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee, the DNC, in Washington, D.C. office building, uh, in an incident that was referred to subsequently as Watergate. Their investigation eventually led to the revelations that the Republican president, sitting president, Nixon, Richard Nixon, had illegally wiretapped the offices of the DNC. This would subsequently lead to Nixon's resignation um, following the critical investigation undertaken by Woodward and Bernstein. But this only came to light because Woodward and Bernstein were in receipt of anonymous information from an informant who was subsequently known as Deep Throat, a reference that was made to the title of a very popular pornographic film at that time. Woodward said he would protect Deep Throat's identity until that man died or allowed his name to be revealed, and for more than 30 years, only Woodward, Bernstein and a handful of others knew who the informant's identity was, until it was claimed by his family in the Vanity Fair magazine that the informer happened to be the former FBI Associate Director W. Mark Felt in May 2005. Woodward immediately confirmed the veracity of this claim and subsequently published a book titled The Secret Man that detailed his relationship with Felt. Now we must ask, why did the FBI Associate Director not wish to be named? or Why did he want to contribute information to these journalists that was critical of the President? Well, of course, the obvious answer is... He feared for reprisals, and not just reprisals against him, but also against his family and loved ones by the state. In this regard, the anonymity of the source was paramount. There have been many other high-profile whistleblowers in recent years, from Jaina Winter uh, and the Aurora shooting that took place in Colorado. She was a Fox News reporter who had been facing the threat of jail time for refusing to reveal her confidential sources. She successfully used New York State's shield law to protect her from revealing who it was that leaked uh, James Holmes notebook in which he claimed he was going to kill people in that Aurora shooting. Similarly, we've had Christopher Wiley uh, outing Cambridge Analytica uh, in Carol Cadwallader's expose here in the UK. 
Although that example is somewhat different to the two American examples that I've given, in which both Winter and Woodward and Bernstein try to protect the identity of their source, their whistleblower, for as long as possible. The Cadwallader example, it sought to publish the identity of Christopher Wiley in as visible a way as possible. And there are lots of reasons for this, uh, which hopefully we'll get around to discussing either here or in your digital seminars. But the underlying notion that journalists should protect their sources is something that Hill and Lashmore have claimed is, is very important. They say, and I quote, It's the fixed point on the ethical firmament to which all other journalism principles are anchored, and it reflects the highest aspiration of reporting, to inform the public whatever the personal cost to the journalist. Clearly, it's the journalist who stumbles across a story that might have serious implications for the national interest who is much more likely to find themselves measuring themselves up against this particular yardstick, rather than, say, a local sports writer delving into the machinations of a football club. But that's not to say that corporate corruption is impossible to cover at any level. There have been many notable whistleblowing incidents in sport. We've seen whistleblowers actively involved in covering spot fixing in, in cricket. We've seen corruption being revealed in Olympic bids and in World Cup bids. And who could forget the relationship played by Emma O'Reilly in exposing Lance Armstrong's doping scandal in the world of cycling? Sport has certainly had its level of controversies and willing whistleblowers. While certainly interesting, these events from the world of sport may not quite change the world in the same way that the infamous revelations of summer 2003 did. That threatened, they threatened to undermine diplomatic relationships between America and the United Kingdom, particularly in relationship to the imminent war in Iraq. I'm speaking here of the relationship that transpired between the then BBC journalist Andrew Gilligan and the United Nations weapons inspector Dr David Kelly and his revelations back in 2003. Writing in The Independent, journalist Tim Luckhurst wrote, and I quote, The legend of Deep Throat runs deep, and to British journalists it conveys a solitary absolute. Confidential sources must never be identified while they are alive. End quote. That's because in May 2003, Andrew Gilligan went on air on Radio 4's The Today programme and would appear uh, later on throughout the morning uh, in a variety of BBC broadcasts, claiming that he had on good authority that the dossier that the United States had presented to the United Nations Security Council had been somewhat sexed up and was described as a dodgy dossier. In this report, it was claimed that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction which it was capable of attacking, uh, or launching, sorry, at Western targets and attacking them within a 45-minute readiness window. Now, Iraq had been subject to regular United Nations weapons inspection measures for some years following their invasion of Kuwait back in the 1990s. Weapons Inspections Team had regularly been involved in investigating any potential weapons production plants, chemical weapons production plants that existed within Saddam Hussein's Iraq throughout that period. So when Andrew Gilligan had it from a well-placed source that those claims that were presented to the United Nations as a justification for the invasion of Iraq were based on faulty evidence, he saw his opportunity to kind of expose the corruption at the centre of this push for war, and in doing so, made a series of different mistakes, uh, all of which would kind of transpire or come out into the light at the subsequent Hutton Inquiry wherein the BBC was castigated for its lack of corroboration and uh, doubling down on sources. It turned out that it was very easy to pinpoint that the one source that contributed to the doubt placed upon the, the dodgy dossier could be traced back to a British weapons inspector and perhaps one of the most prominent weapons inspectors uh, in the world, Dr David Kelly. Dr. David Kelly would kill himself in May 2003. 
Even though he did point to failings in the rationale for going to war, he knew that his career and his reputation would be left in tatters, so much so that he took his own life. And thus pointing to the need to protect sources whilst they are still alive. Gilligan was found wanting and subsequently lost his role at the BBC, who also found itself heavily criticised by government, to the point that they had to reorganise their entire uh, kind of governance measures. While the UK might not have had the equivalent of the FBI whistleblower revealing current sensitive info, it has had its own spy-driven revelations. The former MI5 science officer Peter Wright claimed in his book Spycatcher that the UK Security Service had plotted to remove Prime Minister Harold Wilson from office uh, and that the Director General of MI5 was a Soviet spy. After its publication in Australia, which the Thatcher government tried to block, the government attempted to ban the book in Britain using the Official Secrets Act. Through litigation, it succeeded in imposing a gag order on English newspapers to prevent them from publishing rights allegations. The gags were upheld by the law lords. English newspapers attempting proper reportage of spy catcher's principal allegations were served gag orders. On persisting, they were tried for contempt of court, although those charges would eventually be dropped. Throughout this entire uh, furore, the book continued to be sold in Scotland. Moreover, Scottish newspapers were not subject to any of the English legal gagging orders and continued to report on the affair. Quantities of the book easily reached English book purchasers from Scotland, whilst other copies were smuggled into England from Australia and from Europe. Eventually, in 1988, the book was cleared for legitimate sale when the law lords acknowledged that overseas publication meant that it no longer contained any secrets. However, Wright was barred from receiving any royalties from the sale of his book in the United Kingdom. In November 1991, the European Court of Human Rights ruled that the British government had breached the European Convention of Human Rights in gagging its own newspapers on this subject. The British government's legal costs were estimated to be somewhere in the regions of a quarter of a million pounds back in 1987. In the pre-internet age, journalists mostly had to seek out sources, but with the advent, of course, of social media, this role has become much more reversed. It may seem like it makes the job of journalists easier, but this might not obviously be the case. Despite journalists and their readers and people who wish to reveal information finding it ever so easy to stay in touch with each other and to communicate with each other, it can be very difficult for journalists to ascertain the veracity of informational sources who approach them. Distinct from sources, though, are whistleblowers. Gomez Mejia et al. defined whistleblowing as an occurrence in which a former or a current employee discloses illegal, immoral or illegitimate practices under the control of the employer to persons or organisations that may be able to take corrective actions. In this case, or for the purposes of today's session, the people who may be able to take corrective actions are journalists. Some whistleblowers may go public and others prefer to remain anonymous, knowing that if they get caught, they may face the sack or they may find it harder to get another job. Whistleblowers tend to be quite rare. Most people are worried about their mortgages, which stops them from angrily exposing what their employer is up to. In some countries, whistleblowing may even result in jail or the death penalty. The US could have sentenced Bradley Manning, now Chelsea Manning, to death. Therefore, it's not something to be taken lightly. To engage in whistleblowing is seldom something accidental or seldom something that hasn't been thought through. The Bradley slash Chelsea Manning situation may seem to be the exception here, but we'll come to discuss that in a bit more detail shortly. Finding and running a confidential source is perhaps one of the most difficult tasks a journalist can face. Often whistleblowers have a complex relationship with the journalist, being both symbiotic and adversarial. They need the journalist, but at the same time they need to demonstrate that they have information that is in the public interest, which sometimes journalists disagree about. On the one hand, they serve as sources of story ideas and information, which can end up as high-profile exposés. And sometimes whistleblowers may feel empowered by media exposure in cases of institutional wrongdoing. See, for instance, the case of Edward Snowden and the NSA. 
But on the other hand, journalists can often be very suspicious of the claims that whistleblowers make, uh, especially as whistleblowers seem to have a certain degree of personal self-interest in the causes that they seek to blow the whistle upon. They may be concerned about how their revelations may impact the professional and personal lives of the journalist, for instance. In British and European contexts more generally, the journalists' right to protect their confidential sources is recognised in principle. This doesn't mean that sensitive story will not bring out the hounds. Private investigators or the security services may well wish to get involved. The first thing they will attempt to do is to look into a journalist's phone records, their metadata associated with their digital footprints, all of which can be easily accessed given recent changes to anti-terrorism laws. The 2013 revelations by Edward Snowden about the complicity of the NSA and the GCHQ in illicitly tapping data communications seriously puts doubt to our faith in privacy. In the digital world, it can become very difficult to protect your sources. Even Googling the name of your source in order to run a character check can leave traceable corroborative of evidence in your web browser's cache, or even in your Google search history or in your ISP's metadata records, all of which can be accessed or retrieved by security services if following correct procedure. Electronic communication, of course, leaves digital breadcrumbs for others to follow. Advice for protecting your sources may seem positively archaic these days. Try to avoid electronic communication, especially web-based, browser-based communication. Meet sources face-to-face. Turn off phones, tablets, computers or location-aware devices well in advance of meeting your source. Avoid meeting in locations with CCTV. If you do use a telephone or email, do not use your real names. If you do use mobile phones, only use pay-as-you-go burner phones for both sides of the conversation and make sure that they're not used for any other communication needs at all. If you do use email, (laughs) is it advisable to create a generic Hotmail account these days? Questionable. It's very difficult to find any form of communication on the surface web that doesn't compromise privacy. You're better off learning how to use PGP or GPG encryption keys in order to create safe and secure encrypted email. This is exactly what Edward Snowden did when he got in touch with The Guardian in order to leak information about the NSA's wiretapping of global data connections. In fact, he even went as far as to upload a video showing journalists how to create the perfect conditions for them to be able to speak to each other encrypted and secure way prior to them actually having further detailed revelatory conversations. In the UK, whistleblowing legislation was introduced by the Public Interest Disclosure Act of 1998, following various financial and rail-based disasters in the 1980s and early 1990s. Despite its name, the legislation never made any reference to the public interest in affording protection to whistleblowers. This changed in the summer of 2013. From then on, workers must reasonably believe that their disclosures are made in the public interest before any protection from dismissal or detriment is obtained. The person making the disclosure must reasonably believe it to be in the public interest, but their belief need not be correct for the protection to stand. The British government's website provides all sorts of interesting information and steps one must take in order to seek protection for blowing the whistle. I'd like to refer you to that in this slide here. However, global insecurity can often lead to serious revisions of protections Uh, There was a major overhaul of the Official Secrets Act, uh, which was rumoured in 2017 to be replaced by an updated Espionage Act that would give powers or give powers to the courts, sorry, to increase jail terms against journalists accused of receiving official material that they shouldn't have got their hands on. Please note that this is for journalists to be in receipt of information. Not necessarily have opened it or to have used it in any way, but for journalists to have received information. The the suggestion was that journalists who receive information pertaining to whistleblowing may find themselves culpable in the legal proceedings brought against the whistleblower. This act was subject to serious revisions by Savid Javid, the Home Secretary, in 2019 in order to kind of prevent 
uh, Edward Snowden type revelation taking place in the UK. However, the real reason whistleblowing has become so prominent in the last decade is because of one site in particular, uh, and it's to this site which I'd like to turn my attention to for the remainder of this session. That site in question is WikiLeaks. In January 2010, the US Secretary of State at that time was Hillary Clinton, and she delivered a speech on internet freedom in Washington, D.C. She spoke of, and I quote, the right of people to freely access information. And she said that access to information helps citizens to hold their governments accountable, end quote. Her government, she said, stood, f quote, for a single internet where all of humanity has equal access to knowledge and ideas, end quote. The limits of this position were to be both tested and revealed throughout 2010 as the United States administration and the world responded to a series of revelations facilitated by the activist whistleblower site WikiLeaks. In April 2010, WikiLeaks released a video they entitled Collateral Murder, which they claimed showed civilians, including two Reuters journalists, being shot dead by US forces. In July, they provided more than 90,000 classified documents from the Afghan war to the Guardian newspaper, the New York Times newspaper and the Spiegel newspaper in Germany. 
this was dwarfed on the 23rd of October that year, when the same three publications, along with Al Jazeera, Le Monde, and the UK broadcaster Channel 4, published simultaneous stories about the occupation of Iraq. These reports all drew upon a cache of 391,832 classified US military documents obtained by WikiLeaks. And on the 29th of November 2010, the incident known as Cablegate began, with the publication in five major Western newspapers of stories based on 251,287 secret diplomatic cables sent from more than 250 US-based embassies. This time, the WikiLeaks website, which was hosting these cables and this trove of information, came under extraordinary political pressure. It lost its access to the domain name WikiLeaks.org, Amazon, which provided the web space through its uh, web hosting services, PayPal, Visa and MasterCard, all withdrew their services from the organisation. A loose coalition of supporters using the collective label Anonymous engaged in a string of electronic civil disobedience actions against the websites of these companies and more, coordinating through spaces such as 4chan, Facebook and Internet Relay Chat or IRC channels. The attempts to block access to the WikiLeaks website provided an important demonstration of John Gilmore's famous observation that, quote, the net interprets censorship as damage and roots around it, end quote. By the 10th of December 2010, the entire contents of the WikiLeaks website was mirrored across more than 1,500 other websites. The emergence of WikiLeaks onto the political stage was a vivid example of the transformation of the media from the broadcast paradigm of the 20th century into a much more complex 21st century convergent environment. And yet, the WikiLeaks events also point to some crucial continuities. Viewed from a certain angle, the WikiLeaks stories seemed to be all about the new. It was a YouTube sensation, a Facebook sensation, a Twitter sensation. But viewed from a different angle, the story is one of long-established media industries and their practices. For one thing, WikiLeaks was also a newspaper phenomenon. All the online sharing and argument, all the social networking and collaborative chatter, they were catalyzed by the publication of material provided by WikiLeaks too, publications like The Guardian, like The New York Times, and other long-established news organisations. WikiLeaks needed their professional skills at, at filtering and, and uh, editorial curation. The convergent media environment, then, is characterised by both contestation, a challenge, and continuity. With the Cablegate developments, WikiLeaks' figurehead, Julian Assange, became the focus of an international manhunt. Before his arrest in London in December 2010, on charges relating to alleged sexual offences in Sweden, a string of US political figures had issued threats. Presidential hopeful Sarah Palin called for him to be, quote, hunted down like Osama bin Laden, end quote. One senior Canadian political aide called publicly for his assassination. Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks, has issued a warning that has his supporters, uh, they're ready to publish a deluge of leaked documents if his activities are curtailed or if he's killed or arrested. But what's the political implication here? Who gets hurt the most by this doomsday bomb? So far, these documents are all State Department related. And just yesterday, Hillary Clinton announced that this would be the last public office she intends to hold. Coincidence? or not, Bob, what about it? All of a sudden, there was rumor that, that Hillary Clinton was kind of laying back during the midterm elections and laying back during South Korea, North Korea conflict, and then this, because the thought was that she was maybe make a run for president in 2012, and now this, is this a mark on her record? No, and I, I, I would not for a second to say that it's absolutely not the case that she may run. I think she may run. She may not think she's going to run, but she may run. Uh, the other thing is, who gets hurt from this? The American people. The way to deal with, in the, in the, in, in the national security of the United States, the way to deal with this is pretty simple. We've got special ops forces. I mean, a, a dead man can't leak stuff. This guy's a traitor, a treasonist, and, and, and he has broken every law of the United States. The guy ought to be... And I'm not for the death penalty, so if I'm not for the death penalty, I only want to do it, illegally shoot the son of a b The U.S. government warned university students that discussing WikiLeaks on Facebook could damage their job prospects. Providing information to news media was shown to be a new kind of thought crime, where a storytelling based on that information appeared to remain a protected activity. 
there were no public calls from elected officials or political aides for the editor of The Guardian to be assassinated, for instance. But this hacker, hmm, yes, Assange, he should be killed. With each of the four key WikiLeaks events in 2010, much attention went to the nature of the publication rather than to the content of the documents, with WikiLeaks itself and Julian Assange in particular becoming the focus of considerable attention. Many details lent these events an air of radical media transformation. The online distribution of such huge quantities of secret data, the exotic name of the website itself, and the intriguing figure of Assange who, until his arrest, was said to be in constant transit, holding encrypted computers in his luggage. The medium and the messenger were in this case as fascinating as the message, leading to a certain amount of hyperbole. Journalism scholar Jay Rosen, for instance, described WikiLeaks as, quote, the world's first stateless news organisation, end quote, despite it not actually being a news publisher. It was more of an intermediary, a site that hosted other people's information. WikiLeaks is not a news organisation, stateless or otherwise, despite what Rosen may wish to say. Placing a quarter of a million raw documents on a website is not the same thing as producing news, which is the industrial process of creating and distributing non-fictional drama, of giving shape and structure to raw information. Storytelling. WikiLeaks does not produce news. Rather, it is the source of raw material for news organisations, which simultaneously make that raw material available to anyone through their websites. WikiLeaks' role in channeling information to news media is more in common with the communication strategies of powerful sources like the Pentagon or the Metropolitan Police Force than with journalism. Where WikiLeaks differs from such established sources is in exemplifying what Brian McNair called the cultural chaos of a global networked media environment. He quotes, The possibilities allowed for dissent, openness and diversity rather than the closure, exclusivity, and ideological homogeneity, end quote. Assange himself wrote that his project illustrated what he called a new form of scientific journalism. I'll quote him here. Scientific journalism allows you to read a news story, then to click online to see the original document it is based on. That way, you can judge for yourself, is the story true? Did the journalist report it accurately? Yochai Benkler has described this as the see-for-yourself culture of the internet enhanced by the link structure of the web in which trust, reputation and authority do not simply derive from the organisation providing the news, but also from the capacity to trace their sources for oneself. Pictures or video or GTFO. One important conclusion to draw from WikiLeaks and its campaign to enforce radical transparency on powerful institutions is that it highlights how the convergent media environment is characterised by both contestation and continuity. There are new actors and there are old industries. There are contending modes of distribution and visibility and there are complex assemblages of networked digital media. To see this, ask yourself, why would WikiLeaks involve itself with established media organisations at all? Why doesn't it just post its caches of data on its own website and be done with it? It's because those organisations, like The Guardian, like The New York Times, bring distribution networks that complement rather than replace the WikiLeaks website. They add the credibility and the authority of long-established news brands to what could otherwise be dismissed as a niche website with a weird name, and they set the agenda for other news media to follow. In short, WikiLeaks needed established journalism and journalists to be taken seriously and to be given credibility. As an activist project, WikiLeaks wants to bring attention to the documents it can make available. News organisations can help with this. More importantly, they bring journalists who, at their best, can analyse and sift through the raw material, can test the evidence, can redact the details that might endanger named individuals, who can offer context to help readers interpret the material. Journalists can shape the data into stories, into reports, into commentaries that make sense of the material for audiences who lack, of course, the time and the expertise to process these hundreds of thousands of specialised documents for themselves. Now, those documents may be available online in their raw form for anyone who wishes to try, but it's journalists who make sense of these things, who make them stories that people want to read. When the internet first launched to the public, as we know it as the World Wide Web in the summer of 1991, it was greeted with widespread enthusiasm by the commentators of the day who sought as ending the privileged access to information. 
that had previously been enjoyed primarily by academic researchers and military personnel. It was opening up of the digital networks to the possibility of mass participation that was greeted with quite a utopian dream of openness. Now, much of this utopian rhetoric of the time is obsessed with the democratising power of the electronic frontier and the ending of traditional gatekeepers of information. Citizens of the web would be free to share what they knew in a digital equivalent of the ancient Greek Acropolis holding power to account. While many social movements have employed the internet to mobilise, support and coordinate action, more general hopes for a reinvigoration of democratic processes have been progressively dashed as technological potentials have been commandeered by corporate and government initiatives designed to reinstitute top-down control. As Snowden has revealed, we know that the internet is great at tracking and monitoring and connecting people and making the work of the security services ever easier. Breveni and Murdoch have pointed out that the web's arrival as an everyday utility is intersected with economic and political shifts that have shaped its development in fundamental ways. Three are particularly relevant to the present discussion. Marketization, the consolidation of the security state, and the erosion of the United States position as the primary global superpower. On the first point, marketization, neoliberal forces have increasingly made the internet no longer this utopian space whereby anyone can communicate with anybody else, free from gatekeepers. We've got new gatekeepers today. They are the informational gatekeepers as embodied in the likes of Google and Facebook and any of the other big tech players who drive the attention economy today. With regards to the second point, the consolidation of the security state, the internet and our devices that are ever connected to the internet can track our footprint across various websites, platforms and services, who can often follow us in our pockets to various geolocation based places. These this monitoring, the monitoring of these sites and services and these tools has made it ever easier for agents of state security to keep an eye on who is saying what to whom and how frequently. When all of our metadata is monitored, it can become very difficult to feel that you have the freedom to say what you want to say to whom you want to say it. Despite the fact that we have lots of wonderful platforms like Facebook and YouTube to express ourselves upon. Now on the final point, the United States has attempted to conserve its global hegemony by ensuring that any dissenting voices can be found, can be tracked, can be traced and can be hounded out. It's one of the reasons why many people claim Julian Assange's kind of sex crimes arrest that was issued by Interpol was part of a deliberate attempt to silence his dissent and his critical voice in an era in which American control and American influence was being severely undermined and questioned. It's why figures like Edward Snowden, the former NSA security contractor, who went public with the extent to which the NSA and various American agencies can spy on members of the public online, have been hounded and chased around the world. Snowden fled to China and then to Russia in his attempt to escape the grasps of the American uh, government who wished to see him held accountable for his, scare quotes, crimes. So the good news is they found some of these terrorist cell phones and on right. those cell phones, you know, it's a treasure trove. Right. And within the treasure trove is they found these encrypted apps um, and they believe they knew to use encrypted communications because of the Edward Snowden revelations. What was it you said earlier about, 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 about Snowden? Snowden? Uh, I said that I thought he ought to be brought back to the United States and tried before a jury of his uh, peers if convicted of treason, which is, I think, the appropriate uh, uh, charge. Um, Didn't you say you thought he had? Yeah, well, it was still a it's still a capital crime, and I would uh, give him the death sentence, and I would uh, prefer to see him hanged by the neck until he was dead rather than merely electrocuted. Wow. I think the blood of a lot of these French uh, young people is on his hands uh, because of what he revealed. Because of what he turned loose. His sharing of information with people like Laura Pointus and Glenn, Gre Glenn Greenwald at the Guardian of things like the PRISM collection tool that was being used by the NSA helped shine a light on exactly how much of our everyday lives is subject to a surveillance type gaze. And it could be increasingly difficult for people like Assange and Snowden to act in the capacity as whistleblowers. Although it should be noted that Assange wasn't really the whistleblower. 
he was in receipt of information from uh, military personnel, Bradley, now Chelsea, Manning. And it was Manning who was the real whistleblower in this regard. They passed information, of course, to WikiLeaks and it went public from that, that, from that point onwards. Of course, Manning was subject to the same kind of calls for their, their life at the hands of American officials uh, and was fortunate, is that the correct way to describe Chelsea Manning, to only find themselves sentenced to a, a prison service or prison sentence in a, mil in a military jail rather than facing the death penalty for treason or sedition. And yet still, there are people willing to expose and to leak secret, controversial, confidential documents to the public via WikiLeaks, via established journalists, in order to reveal the kind of machinations of the most powerful organisations on the planet. Where will this lead? Who knows? But it's becoming an ever more punitive environment for people to publish information like this into the public domain. It's emerged that it was the Prime Minister who instructed Britain's most senior civil servant to tell the Guardian newspaper to destroy a computer which held files from the whistleblower Edward Snowden. The ceremony that took place in your basement, when um, the secret ceremony, you all just broke up the hard disks and the laptops, is that right? Is that what everyone... Yeah, thought? it's harder to break up a... smash up a computer than you might think. The paper, which had other copies of the Snowden files overseas, agreed to take an angle grinder to the computer while the intelligence agents watched. We had the uh, initial pressure in which the cabinet secretary arrived in my office and told me we'd had enough debate on this subject. The state de decrees there's been enough debate, we'll stop that. Uh, and decided to drill out the hard disks of our computers uh, in order to stop us reporting from London. In America, the White House spokesman was asked, would Obama ever do such a thing? Uh, that's very difficult to imagine a scenario in which that would be appropriate. The serious point is this, and, and, it, go, and it goes back to Spycatcher, that, that I was completely clear with the, with the Cabinet Secretary that there were copies elsewhere, uh, and that, that the destruction of these computers was not going to stop reporting. It was just a public relations exercise in the end. I, I wouldn't say that, but I would say it was, it was pointless. Their, their, their aim was to, to stop publication and to have a dialogue of the sort that we were having, and Mr. Robbins's witness statement makes it apparent the reason they didn't go for an injunction was because they felt yes. that we were behaving responsibly. They lost control of the documents the moment they destroyed them in London. So in summary, whistleblowing has got a long history. The contexts in which whistleblowing have taken place uh, have never been static. They've always changed from an analog era to a digital era. It's become probably more difficult to, to keep secrets in the digital era, but at the same time, it's become much more punitive to publish those secrets. The internet as a platform to bypass journalists uh, certainly has is something that warrants considering with the advent of sites like WikiLeaks. And it's not the only kind of public disclosure platform that exists, but it is probably the most high profile. Do we still need journalists? I think my underlying kind of argument is that, of course, we do. They are the people that make sense of the information. They are the people who are best positioned to kind of tell stories with that information. They are the people who are probably more sensitive to the ethical considerations given what's happened in the kind of sphere of investigative journalism over the last decade. Whistleblowers sometimes can become the story themselves. 
see the case of Christopher Wiley in the Cambridge Analytica scandal, see the case of Edward Snowden, see the case of Julie Assange. But the case of Christopher Wiley has led to a situation in which people are, and Edward Snowden, where people are choosing to reveal the secrets and reveal who they are from the off. Chelsea slash Bradley Manning tried to stay hidden to some extent, in much the same way that uh, W. Mark Felt stayed hidden as the FBI informer in, deep, in the Deep Throat instance. But in a world where we're all digitally connected, perhaps it actually makes more sense to be out in public, to be visible, to be seen. Because if you can be seen, it prevents nefarious agents from doing something particularly damaging to you. Although that may be small comfort to the family of Jamal Khashoggi. <laughs>